So my presentation today is about flavor. Um, it's fundamentally about where the flavor in our food comes from and how we've changed it, but it addresses a much more fundamental and important question, which is the problem of obesity. I'm asking the question, why do we all eat so much? And I'm posing an answer that we have rarely stopped to consider, which is that we've changed the very flavor of the food we eat. Simply put, the, the whole foods that we grow are getting blander and blander due to uh, selective breeding and high yield agriculture. And the processed foods that we eat so much of are ever more blitzed with the flavorings that make them irresistible. So you're probably wondering, what does a Canadian who lives in a big city who studied philosophy possibly have to tell you all about farming, about soil health, and about what you do? And the short answer is, I don't know. Uh, it sort of occurred to me as soon as I heard that intro. Not sure what I'm doing here, but uh, let's see where it goes. Uh, I was here several years ago. Um, maybe some of you were present. I gave a talk about my first book, Steak. Um, at that time, I missed my friend Gabe Brown because I thought Gabe lived in South Dakota, so I didn't tell him I was in Mandan. And then I was speaking to Gabe earlier this year because he just published his new book. We were talking about that. And I told him, I'm coming back to Mandan. He said, well, you've got to give me a call. And then later on, I looked at the, uh, the schedule and I realized I'm actually going to Bismarck. And I only realized yesterday that they're not quite as far apart as I had previously thought. Um, <laughs> the reason I'm admitting this is because this is payback. I'm Canadian, and the, the level of geographic ignorance that Americans have about Canada is such that you really, you really deserve what you got from me just now. <laughs> you guys aren't so bad, because you're not far from Manitoba, and you have a general sense of things. But when I go to places like LA, they ask me if I'm worried that global warming might cause my igloo to melt. <laughs> and I say, of course I am. <laughs> so I want to talk to you today about what is our biggest problem. I have very cleverly given you a hint in the font that I have chosen for the word biggest. Can anybody tell me what that might be? This is, this is basically our number one social health problem. Sorry? Obesity, excellent. Looked at the font. This is where obesity was in the United States in 1960. This is when we started measuring it. Um, so this is about as far back as the records go. We have some idea about where things were in the 1940s, for example, but, but the really solid national measurement began in the early 1960s, and obesity stood at 13.4%. Well, here's where it is today, 36%. In fact, there was an even more recent study that just came out, 39.6%. It's 40% of the population where I live. Seems a bit lower, 29%, but when you, when you add the obese and the overweight together in Canada, you get 70%, which is roughly where it is today. So the... Centers for Disease Control will talk about only 30% of the population now is of normal weight. How could it be normal if it's 30%? It's abnormal to be normal, which is where things have come. This is what it looks like over time. You can see this ramping up. You can see that starting in 1960 and where things get to in 2009. A lot of people, you may have read in the newspaper that obesity is now the number one preventable cause of death. This isn't true. It's the second leading cause of preventable death. The leading cause is still smoking. Smoking still wears that crown. But obesity is the number one leading cause of preventable morbidity. That's what scientists call it, morbidity, which is to say unnecessary disease and suffering. Obesity is number one, even more than smoking. Smoking's got a bigger chance that it'll kill you. But obesity is causing more suffering and more needless disease. Think of how weird that is. Think of this in incredible level that we've gotten to. The, the immense power that we have over our environment and over our bodies, we have almost eliminated infectious disease. So many of the, the healthcare statistics that we track are improving. Heart disease is improving. We are very slowly making gains on cancer. There are so many types of cancer that we're able to treat now that we were not able to treat 50 years ago. And, you know, that progress isn't as fast as we'd like it to be, but it is progress. And yet, when it comes to obesity, we have been fighting a public war, waging a public battle, and we're losing. It's like trying to fight a fire, only to look, realize that the hose that you're aiming at the fire, it's like it's filled with gasoline or something. It's just not working. Um, we all have theories. Um, food has become like politics, 
that we argue about it now at family get-togethers. You get together for Thanksgiving. It used to be that people would argue about politics, and they started arguing about food, about carbs or fat. I think now we're back to arguing about politics. Now maybe we argue about them both. Does anyone here have any theories on that? Does anyone think, you know, for a long time, if anyone was alive in the 1980s, I know it doesn't look it, but I was also alive in the 1980s, um, we thought fat was the problem. Does anyone here think that eating fat can make you fat? Is, I, get the, I got one of these. So everyone else is, okay. So if I ate what I ate, my normal diet, but for, let's say, six months, I also ate a pound of liquid butter before bed. I just gulped it down. Would I gain weight? Anyone think I would gain weight? Does anyone want to raise their hand? One, okay, but four people. I think I'd definitely gain weight. I think I would definitely gain weight. What about carbs? Carbs make you gain weight? Carbs, yeah. What do you, if you want to get your, any livestock, people here have livestock. How do you get your livestock? Fat. What do you feed them? You feed them carbs, right? You feed them carbs. There's a reason for that, though. Carbs are cheaper than fat, and they're way easier to store. But you can get livestock fat on fat. It's just be really, you know, how are you going to put fat in your feed bunk? Now, we've sort of even gotten more focused recently in our obsession with macronutrients. It's not just carbs that we talk about. We talk about sugar. So does anyone here think sugar is worse than just plain old carbs? Sugar. Sugar is deadly, right? Sugar is a carb. You know, wheat flour is just sugar, but it's a long chain of sugars, which is a starch. Now, what about, it's even like one thing worse than sugar. Has anyone, can anyone name that it's a type of sugar that's even worse than sugar? High fructose corn syrup. That stuff is like, you just take a whiff of that and you drop dead. <laughs> what we're really worried about with high fructose corn syrup is the fructose, right? So, does anyone know how much fructose is in high fructose corn syrup? They call it uh, HFCS55. So it's 55% fructose. As compared to table sugar, anyone know how much fructose is in table sugar? It's 50. 50% 50 fructose in table sugar, 55% in high fructose corn syrup. When you think about it that way, you're like, whoa, there's a lot of fructose in table sugar, isn't there? So I want to talk to you about a different way of looking at our eating problem. And I want you all to think about eating not so much as the stuff that winds up here, but as a behavior, because we are all the eaters. Eating is what we do. So maybe our behavior, maybe what we want to do has something to do with that. And I want to start by telling you a story about a guy named Arch West. Anyone here watch that show Mad Men? About those New York, uh, New York advertising firm in the 1950s? Very glamorous, they smoked cigarettes and drank whiskey, all the women are beautiful. Arch West could have walked right off the set of that show. He lived in New York in the 1950s. He was a Madison Avenue ad guy. He worked on the Jell-O Puddings account. He worked on the Campbell Soup account. And in 1959, he got a call from the Frito Company. And they invited him to move down with his family to be the vice president of sales and marketing for, for Fritos, the little corn chips that everybody loves. So Arch took the job. Shortly after he got there, Frito merged with the Lay's chip company to become a company I'm sure none of you have heard of called Frito-Lay. Arch West, the Madison Avenue ad guy, is the VP of sales and marketing. And not long after he got there, he decided to take his wife and his three kids on a trip to California. He somehow did not have a third row of seats, yet he managed to pack them all into the back of a Lincoln, and he drove out to California. And he had a pretty interesting experience on that trip. He ate at his favorite restaurant, which is owned by a buddy of his named Lawrence Frank, called the Five Crowns, where he had his favorite meal, which was prime rib, and he had cream spinach and all the fixings. And as he was walking out of the restaurant, this tall stranger with dark hair came and complimented Arch on his daughter's beautiful golden hair. And they got to talking, and the stranger asked, well, have you ever heard of my restaurant? They're both in the food business. And the West said, no. We, they'd never heard of it, only because this guy's restaurant hadn't quite made it to Dallas yet. And the guy was Ray Kroc, McDonald's. And what's so interesting about this moment is that these two seminal figures in the history of 20th century food passed almost like two ships in the night. They exchanged compliments. They never spoke again. The life-defining moment on that trip for Arch West came a couple days later. He was driving down to San Diego. And his daughter told me they passed what she described as a little Mexican shack by the side of the road. And Arch was the kind of guy, he just had to stop 
and give it a try. And for the first time, he tasted a tortilla chip. And it must have been the crunch that got him, because the, the thing that makes a tortilla chip different from a frito is that it's baked and then fried, so it's got just a little bit more crunch. And he bit into this tortilla chip, and he thought, he was struck with a vision, this is going to be the next big thing for my company, Frito-Lay, the tortilla chip. So he came back to Dallas. He pitched this idea to the management, to his fellow executives, and they just sort of looked at him. They thought, why, why would we want to sell tortilla chips when we already sell Fritos? They're kind of the same thing. They shot it down. He got the red light. But he knew better. Arch West was so confident in the future of the tortilla chip that he actually funneled discretionary funds into an off-site facility to learn how to make these tortilla chips. He came up with a name that in kind of a pigeon, highly bastardized Spanish meant little pieces of gold. And he repitched it. This time he had samples. And this time he had a name. And he said, gentlemen, I give you Doritos. And this time he got the green light. And I know what you're thinking. This is the moment when our food system changed, when everything would never be the same as it was. And that's in fact not true. Because the very first Doritos that were marketed were just like those tortilla chips that Arch West ate by the side of the road. They were just salted tortilla chips. You can see right there it says toasted corn taste because that's all that was on them. And they bombed. They didn't sell. In the Southwest, where there was kind of a Hispanic cultural influence, where people knew that you could take a tortilla chip and dip it in a bean dip or into salsa, they did okay. It was just another brand of tortilla chips. Everybody knew what a tortilla chip was. But in the rest of the country, the complaint was, this snack sounds Mexican, and it doesn't taste Mexican. So Arch West has to go up and face the group of executives that he lied to, that he took money that he wasn't supposed to take and developed this concept of his, and now it was bombing. And they said, what are you going to do about Doritos? And he said, gentlemen, I propose that we make them taste like taco. And this got peals of laughter. One of them said, our Yankee friend from the north doesn't know the difference between a thing and a flavor. And it was a very good observation to make, because up until that time, different things had different flavors. If you wanted to experience the flavor of strawberries, you had to get strawberries. If you want to experience the flavors of an apple, well, you had to go buy an apple. If you wanted to experience the flavor of a taco, you had to go to the considerable difficulty of making a taco, which meant cooking meat and chopping onions and getting tortilla. But Arch knew, probably because of his friendship with that guy out in California, Lawrence Frank, because Lawrence Frank invented something you probably heard of called Larry's Seasoned Salt. He was an industry guy, food industry guy. And through Lawrence Frank, that's probably how Arch knew that there was new technology, that about 10 years earlier, this device had been invented called the gas chromatograph, which meant that scientists could finally figure out what flavor was. They could figure out the tiny little chemicals in food that made food taste like it tastes. And as soon as we figured out what they were, we started putting them into stuff. So Arch was right. You could take a Dorito and give it, you could make it taste exactly like a taco, but you could give it that savory zing. So after these came out, no one's ever seen these, these came out, taco-flavored Doritos. And this is the moment that changed everything. Because with a dusting of flavor compounds, a snack that nobody wanted to eat became a snack that people could not stop eating. So let's just think about that for a moment, because the nutritional profile of this snack did not change at all. There's exactly the same amount of carbs, exactly the same amount of fat, and exactly the same amount of salt. That supposedly magical combination wasn't enough to get people to eat Doritos. But you put on a sprinkling of flavor, and that's a game changer. All of a sudden, people cannot get enough. And we know the story of Doritos. Taco flavor came out first, then it was nacho cheese, then it was Cool Ranch, and now there's so many, you can't even keep track of it. Everyone knows what a Dorito is. And I'm not here today to tell you that Doritos are our problem. I'm here to tell you that everything has basically turned into a Dorito. So I want you to think about Doritos as being that triangle of fried cornmeal, the tortilla chip, blitzed in flavoring. And I want you to think about them being 
two parts of a whole. And I want to talk first about the chip part, and I'll get to the flavoring later. Because even the corn in those mid-1960s Doritos was just a little bit different than the corn was back when the Frito Company was founded in 1932. There were differences in yield. We know about the explosive gains in corn yield. So it was at 27 bushels per acre in 1932. By 1967, when those taco-flavored Doritos came out, it was at 80.1 bushels per acre. That's astonishing. I mean, most people didn't notice, right? You drive by a cornfield, you, you have to be in the business to know that corn changed, because most people just drive by a field and it looks like a field of corn. Well, look at where it was, look at where it's now, 170 bushels per acre. Now, this isn't a story exclusive to corn. Look at what happened with oranges. 176 boxes per acre in 1932, up to 328. This is even more interesting. Look at strawberry yields. 8,400 weight per acre, up to 720. That's almost, that's almost an order of magnitude. Now, it's really no surprise, right? I mean, we all know this to be true, and we all know how we paid for it, because when you go to the supermarket and buy one of those big honking California strawberries, it looks like a strawberry. It kind of smells a bit like a strawberry, and it has absolutely no flavor. It's just like wet cardboard. But there's something even more bland than a strawberry, and that's a supermarket tomato. Well, it's been a revolution. And in many ways, I'm critical of it, but it's a good thing it happened because we have less farmland today than we used to have, and we have far more mouths to feed. If it wasn't for this, the Green Revolution, people would be starving. We have made incredible gains in yield. We can yield, we can wring so much more food from the same acre of land as we could 80 or 100 years ago. It's astonishing. But we rarely ask, did this... Did this come at any kind of price? We got all this gain on one side. Was there, was there any kind of a loss? Well, that question was asked by the magazine Organic Gardening in 1999 by a woman named Cheryl Long. She had read a study that was published in the British Journal of Nutrition that analyzed modern varieties of whole foods and old varieties and found that the old varieties seemed to have more nutrition, more vitamins and minerals. Which is kind of disturbing, right? Because even though none of us eat whole foods, we like to think in the back of our head, well, if I did eat a carrot, at least it would be good for me. Only it's not as good as it used to be. So Cheryl Long sent a letter to the secretary of the USDA and said, what is going on with the nutrition in our food? The USDA lost the letter. So she sent another one. She had to send, I think, four by the time she finally got a response. And the response was, yeah, it really does look that way, but don't worry, there's nothing to worry about. It could be that there's just more water in a modern carrot or a modern piece of celery. Or maybe, maybe the way we measure it has changed, but really, there's nothing here to worry about, so don't worry about it. Well, one guy did worry about it. His name's Donald Davis. He's a biochemist at the University of Texas. And he thought, this really doesn't look like good news. But he read that British study, and he said they did a whole bunch of things wrong. So he set out to do a definitive study that would truly ascertain are the whole foods that we grow, the wholesome things that come out of the ground, are they losing nutrition? And he found that there is an undeniable trend, and it's going that way. The whole foods that we grow are losing the micronutrients, the stuff that we know is good for us. Calcium's down by 16%, iron by 15 riboflavin's down by 38%. So this explains, of course, why strawberries and tomatoes, and so much of what we buy in the produce section, which is just heaping with produce, is so bland. Only it doesn't, because there's something really interesting about all the nutrients on this list. We know they're really good for us. They are essential for life. If you didn't get any one of these things, you'd die. But they have no flavor. They have absolutely no flavor. This is one of the things that makes our experience of flavor so mystifying. It's why nutritionists have basically ignored it for the last hundred years. Because if the good stuff that we need has no flavor, well then, I guess flavor isn't good for us. It seems that what we desire in food has no relationship to what we need. Well, that was proved wrong by this guy. His name is Harry Klee. He got his PhD in 1987 and he was immediately hired by Monsanto company, I'm sure many of you all know, to fix what was wrong with tomatoes. 
Because everybody knows, people in the industry will tell you that tomatoes are great, but they know that tomatoes suck. And everybody thought the reason was because of Granny Smith apples. You can see these bins of Granny Smith apples, and those are in fact not apples, those are tomatoes. And that's what they look like when they're picked. They are green, and they are as hard as a baseball. And what they do is they take them to a place like this, where they store them, and you can, you know, you can store them for a while, and then when you need them, you load them up on a truck and you fog them with ethylene gas, which is a plant hormone that kicks in this ripening process so that by the time your tomato gets from Florida to Chicago or um, to New Jersey or to Bismarck, it looks ripe and it looks red and you pick that thing and you say, what a beautiful tomato, and then you pop it in your mouth and you're utterly disappointed. So everybody thought the problem is that we're picking them green and they're not really ripening properly. So they thought, you know, if we could just get the ripening to slow down a bit, we could maybe get them half ripe, then pick them, then store them, then ship them. Life would be grand. So this is what they hired Harry Klee to do. Harry Klee created one of the very first genetically modified tomatoes, and it worked beautifully. In 1991, he walked out into a test plot in Bonita Springs, Florida, and there were all these tomato plants, genetically modified tomato plants, with these beautiful fruits hanging that were just beginning to turn red. And they picked them, and they brought them to this place, and they let them ripen further, and then Harry Klee walked in one day, and he pulled out a Swiss Army knife, and he pulled a tomato out of a box, and he pulled a slice off it, he sliced it, and he popped it in his mouth, and it just wasn't there. The flavor wasn't there. And that's when Harry Klee realized that whatever's wrong with tomatoes, it goes a lot deeper than just picking them green. So he quit his job at, the University of Flor at, at Monsanto. He joined the faculty at the University of Florida, where he has spent, since 1993, he has been studying tomato flavor. He has grown over 500 varieties of heirloom tomatoes to figure out why do some tomatoes taste good and why do some tomatoes taste bad. And what Harry Klee found is that the very same trend that has affected the nutrition in our whole foods has also affected the flavor. This is a very egg-headed looking chart, but I'm going to try and walk you through it. If you look at the two columns, not the far right column, but the two just next to it, the one on the furthest left is an heirloom, a very old tomato, and the one just to the right of it, the one called Floridade, is a new tomato. And if you look, all those things on the left are called volatiles. Those are flavor compounds. You actually, they're the aroma. We actually, t a huge amount of the taste of food is actually aroma. It goes into the back of your mouth and up into your nose. It's called retronasal olfaction. And that's what Harry Klee measured. And you can see, the old variety always has way more than the new one. 16.28 to 5.25. 27.21 to 17.15, 0.21 to 0.03. The trend is undeniable. The old stuff had more flavor than the new stuff. Why? Because of selective agriculture. Because we kept, for decades, we kept selecting tomato plants that produced a lot of tomatoes, that had a good shelf life, and that were disease resistant. We did this over and over and over again. And that's how we got this incredible tomato crop, which is like 10 times the size of the old tomato crop. That's why tomatoes are cheap. That's why you can get them at all year. But the problem is we never selected flavor. And if you don't select a trait, you lose a trait. That's why Greg is talking about getting rid of the, the traits you don't want in your herd. That's also selection. Well, when you, you don't select something, it's gone. It's the same reason we don't have tails anymore. It's reverse evolutionary pressure. So that's what happened. That is the story of the whole foods that we grow. It's not just true of tomatoes and strawberries. It's true of everything that comes out of the ground. There's more of it, but we've lost something in quality. Well, that's not all there is to a Dorito, right? There's also the seasoning. And that brings us to this. This is what a gas chromatograph looks like. This is actually is the machine that Harry Klee uses to analyze the flavors that don't exist in tomatoes anymore. Now, gas chromatograph is really interesting. Like I mentioned earlier, the first one was commercially available in 1955. And this changed our understanding of food. Before that, if you look at some of the old scientific literature written in the 1940s, you'd be amazed at how much they knew about minerals and vitamins, about the exquisite precision with which they could measure those things. But back then, they had no idea what made food flavorful. They would look at an orange, they'd look at a cup of coffee, and they'd just scratch their heads because it didn't seem to matter what kind of analysis they did. They just couldn't figure out what was going on with flavor. Because the flavors in foods are there in such tiny, tiny quantities. They measure them in parts per million. 
sometimes parts per billion, sometimes even parts per trillion. Well, the gas chromatograph just changed everything because you could take a gas chromatograph, you could volatize. That just means you turn something into a gas, tomato, a piece of chicken, a hot dog, and all these vapors come off it, literally the aroma, and it goes through this big tube in the gas chromatograph and they all get separated out and you can sit there at the end of the tube and just capture them and capture each one of those flavor compounds. Sometimes people would even sniff them as they came out the other end. And as soon as they captured flavor in a jar, they analyzed it. They said, well, now we know what it is that makes a strawberry taste like a strawberry, or a tomato taste like a tomato, or a taco taste like a taco. And they said, well, we can make these ourselves. Who needs nature if you've got a flavor factory? And that's what went into those original taco-flavored Doritos. You can see it right there in the ingredient list, flavor. If you look for that word, I encourage you to look for that word in ingredient list now. Pick them up and look for the word artificial flavor, look for the word natural flavor. That's what it is. It's a flavor chemical that has been put there intentionally. Now you might think, well, big deal. You know, these things are put in tiny quantities. I just said parts per million. How bad can it be? These are the same chemicals, by the way, that are natural foods. So I always get these questions, well, are these flavorings toxic? Everyone's always, is it toxic? Is it going to give me brain cancer? No. The answer is no, they're not toxic. I don't think they're going to give you brain cancer. But we have to ask an important question. Because instead of analyzing, thinking about food in terms of what macronutrients, protein, carbs, fat gets into our stomach, why don't we ask the question, why does food have flavor in the first place? If you think of your mouth and nose as your flavor sensing equipment, which is what they are, it takes more DNA. If you, if you think of your DNA as like the instruction manual to, to make you, the thickest chapter is on making your mouth and nose. So from an evolutionary perspective, it must be doing something really important. Why would it be there otherwise? Why is the flavor of food, why does it have this incredible grip on us? Why do we love foods so much and some foods we absolutely hate? Well, I'd ask you to think about it this way. Why is this cow eating a dead rabbit? Why is this deer eating a dead rabbit? I'll tell you why. Some of you who raise livestock may have seen this. When cattle get a mineral deficiency, they will start to eat weird things. A very common sign of a mineral deficiency is, is just chewing on old bones. Well, it's actually not a bad strategy. There's minerals in those old bones. Like Greg said, animals know what they need. If you put the minerals out there free choice, they will get the minerals they need. Well, how do they know that? I mean, they didn't do a degree in biochemistry. What's going on? Well, what's going on is called flavor feedback. I spent many hours with a Professor Fred Provenza from Utah State who studied the astonishing abilities animals have to find the flavor that they need. So what Fred would do is he would, let's say he would take some sheep and he would make them deficient in phosphorus. And then one day he'd put a tube down their throat and he'd blast some phosphorus into their room. And, and that just before he did that, he'd give them some feed that was flavored with coconut. And then the next day he'd put water into their room and, and he'd pair that with the flavor of maple. And over time they would come to associate the flavor of coconut with the mineral that they needed. Because if you made them phosphorus deficient, they would go and gobble up coconut flavored feed, even though there was no phosphorus in that feed. But they had no interest in the maple. Now you might be thinking, well, that sounds pretty smart, but maybe sheep just like coconuts. Well, maybe, but then Fred would reverse the experiment and in another pen he'd pair the maple with the phosphorus and the sheep would come to love maple flavoring. It's how nature has overcome the problem that nutrients have no flavor. Nutrients are very stable molecules. There's no easy way to sense them until they get into your gut and are metabolized. So what we did is we came up with a system to say, well, I might not be able to sense that nutrient, but I will just smell all the stuff associated with it, and that way I get a pretty good database of what, what foods have the stuff that I need. Well, the question is, do humans have this? Because, you know, a cow might know what it needs, but we've got such big brains that we seem to have completely, utterly lost touch with what we need. Well, here's an interesting example. 
We've all heard these stories of the British sailors. When they would sail around the world, they would get scurvy, which is a deficiency of vitamin C. These aren't British sailors, but I feel that this painting evokes the spirit. Everything we're told about scurvy nowadays, if we ever study it, is, is the physical manifestations. People's hair would fall out. Everyone knows this weird symptom that their gums would just get really... They would swell so much that the, the, the swelling, their gums would start per, protruding from their mouths. But for whatever reason, I think because we're such reductionists and we're so focused on the body and we think the brain and our mind has so little connection with it that we've forgotten about what is probably the most astonishing symptom of scurvy, which was called scorbutic nostalgia, which is to say sailors that had scurvy would be paralyzed by a longing to return home and to eat fruits and vegetables. They called them the vegetable productions of the earth. They didn't know. All the, all the scientific egg, eggheads at the time just thought these people were dumb because scurvy had something to do with the humors and how much bile was in your liver. They, the, the actual cures they tried would be things like drinking seawater or burying yourself in earth. And yet there was this intuitive wisdom. There's a, a ship's chaplain in 1748 has a story of uh, a voyage that was just laid low by scurvy. They were throwing bodies overboard every day. They finally land in this island they, um, in the middle of the South Pacific called Juan Fernandez. And what do they do? They scramble ashore and they start digging turnips out of the ground, wild turnips and eating them. They found a moss that tasted like garlic and they ate it and they talked about how delicious it tasted. Now we've all had those cravings. It's the middle of January and you, and you think, more than anything you want is just an orange. Harry Klee found even more evidence that there is some relationship between the flavors that we crave and the nutrients that we need. And I'm gonna take you back to this chart. This was published in the journal Science, which is a very prestigious, very big journal. And you can see right there in the middle, he's got this column called precursor. Basically, Harry was trying to figure out where the flavors come from in tomato, but then he wanted to figure out how does a tomato make the flavor? Because if he could figure that out, he could start to breed for the genes that control flavor. So one day he gave a talk at a big company called Syngenta, and he pointed out one of the metabolic pathways. This is how a tomato makes this particular flavor. And there's a guy in the audience named Steve Goff who said, you know, that's really interesting, because you, Harry, the flavor guy, you're all interested in the flavor, but Steve Goff was a cellular physiologist, and he said, it's really interesting that that tomato makes that flavor from tryptophan, because tryptophan is an essential amino acid. We make protein out of amino acids. And tryptophan is an interesting one, because it's metabolically very expensive to make. It's like, it's like make a Mercedes of amino acids. It just costs a lot. And Steve Goff was struck by this, this interesting relationship, that this important flavor is connected to this kind of expensive, hard-to-get amino acid. So they got together, and Steve said, why don't we just do this for all the flavors that you've identified? And Harry, over the years, has identified that there's about 26 flavor compounds in tomatoes that just drive the flavor. When those compounds are there in the right amount, that is a great tomato. And when they're not there, it's a bland tomato. And what they found is that every single one of those essential flavor compounds is synthesized from an essential nutrient, which is to say that the flavor of a tomato is a big chemical sign telling our brain, there's good stuff, come and get it. This is a beautiful thing. This is how nature works, and it worked so well for millions of years. Our nose and our taste buds led us to what we needed. And in about the last 60 or 70 years, we've changed that because we are so smart that we can analyze the flavors in a tomato, and we can say, well, we'll just make them ourselves. Only when we do that, we leave out the precursor, and we just have the flavor. So we get something like this, ketchup-flavored potato chips. There's the ingredients but there's none of that good stuff. So we've taken that zing, we've taken that quality of tomato-ness that makes our eyes light up and make us go, oh, that is a delicious tomato, and we put it on a fried slice of potato. And our brain doesn't know that. When we pop it in our mouth, our brain thinks, not only am I getting fried slice of potato, I'm also getting all that good tomato stuff. But that's not actually what it gets. That's the same formula for making soda. We always talk about the problem with soda is the sugar. Everyone says there's like 12 teaspoons of sugar in a can of soda. That's true. I'm not saying that's not true. But would anybody drink that if it wasn't for the flavoring? If that was just a bottle of sugary soda water, would anybody drink it? It's the flavoring that makes it taste the way it does. 
It's the flavorings that make Dr. Pepper taste different from Sprite, taste different from Coke, taste different from Pepsi. It's the flavoring that makes this stuff delicious. It's the same thing we did to Doritos. You put that stuff in and all of a sudden, a drink you wouldn't drink becomes a drink you can't stop drinking. And we put this stuff in everything. There's flavorings in margarine. There's flavorings in butter. There's a company, they don't want to go to the trouble of making a cultured butter. Cultured butter's got culture in it, stuff that's good for your microbiome. So they just add a flavoring to make it taste like it's cultured. We've gotten so efficient at how we raise pork that the pork has lost all its flavor. So we just put flavoring back in the pork. Look, go to the supermarket and look at the ingredient list. You very often see that they have to add flavoring to pork. There's flavoring in craisins. There's flavoring in marinated salmon with grill flavor. They don't grill it, but they say, well, we can actually just paint on grill marks and put a grill flavoring, and people won't know the difference. Even the stuff we think is healthy has flavoring in it. Yogurt. They put little bits of strawberry in yogurt, and they put red food coloring so that we, you look at it and you think, oh, there's, there's strawberry in this. This is strawberry yogurt. There's flavoring in it. I don't know if there's any parents in the crowd. Um, my kids are a bit older now, but when they were really little, a really awesome thing to give your kid is one of those yogurt sticks because, you know, they get home from school, they're loud, we would just really like them to be quiet so we can drink a beer or a glass of wine or something. We give them a yogurt stick. Look at a yogurt stick. There'll be pictures of strawberries and blackberries on it. Look at the ingredients. There is no fruit. It's just sugar and flavorings. That's how they make it tasty. Think of the demented information we are pumping into our kids' brains by giving them food experiences like that. It's the same with chicken. They have to put flavoring in chicken to make chicken taste like chicken, because chicken doesn't taste like chicken anymore. So this is the story. This is why I call it the Dorito effect. Everything is turning into a Dorito. What's a chicken nugget? A chicken nugget, they take chicken meat, they blend it into a slurry with water, they add flavoring, they put this Dorito-like coating on it, add flavoring to that, and then they fry it. And then we think, oh, that's delicious. I, talk, I went to visit a chicken nugget manufacturer, and they told me that actually the market's moving away from chicken strips, which are actual pieces of chicken, to chicken nuggets, which have more water in them, because people have essentially gotten conditioned to them. Young people don't like chicken strips. They're too tough. They're too tough. Imagine that. <laughs> now, it all sounds awful. It all sounds like we should get in a time machine and move back to 1945 before we did any of this stuff when food was wholesome. But science is not our enemy. Science is a tool of understanding, and science is how we, we understand the variables in this world, in agriculture and food. It's how we understand the variables in the food that we have, and it's how we tweak them. So we, we have used the tools of science to take food to a very bad place, but we can use those tools to undo what has been done. So I very much want to tell you that it's not all bad news, and that I think everybody in this room has a role to play in turning this around. Harry Klee, who I mentioned who's been studying tomatoes, has created what I would call the perfect tomato. Um, he one day he did something really simple. He just took his best performing heirloom, which is say, the heirloom that people consistently rated, this is the most delicious tomato. It was a, a scrubby looking plant bred in California called a Maglia Rosa and he crossed it with one of these commercial powerhouse tomatoes that just produces a ton of fruit but has no flavor. And he thought he'd get a compromise. He thought he'd get a tomato that had kind of a bit of yield and a bit of flavor. But what he got was a tomato that had excellent yield and had flavor so good it was indistinguishable from its heirloom parent. So this is really good news. Because remember how I told you earlier that flavor is measured in parts per million or parts per billion? That means there's only a teeny, we need a little bit of it. So metabolically, it's not expensive. It means we can keep, if not all of our yields, a lot of them and get the flavor back in. We just need to start breeding for it. We just actually need to care about flavor. This is another tomato that Harry Klee did called a garden treasure. It's more of a slicer. It's got kind of a meatier. If you, if you like tomato sandwiches, I'm someone who thinks a tomato makes a great sandwich. That's your tomato. There's another guy named Elia Raskin at Rutgers who created Rutgers scarlet lettuce. He came at it from a different point of view. He said he wanted to take a food that was relatively benign from a nutritional point of view, not bad, not good, and, and lettuce is just sort of like crispy water. There's not a lot going on. And he said, well, what if I got more nutrition into lettuce? Americans eat a lot of lettuce. We could improve nutrition. So he started to selectively breed lettuce for polyphenols. And polyphenols generally in lettuce tend to be red, so he just basically took a head of red leaf lettuce, put it in the blender, 
looked through his microscope, he picked out the cells that were the most red, he grew them into a new bushy head of lettuce, did the same thing. He did this three times and he eventually got a head of lettuce that had more polyphenols than blueberries. And that's called neutral leaf. So we, we can turn this around. We have the tools to return the goodness to food, not just the nutrition, but the flavor. I think the reason this resonates with the things we've been talking about, about the health of soil, about everything, is that it's all interconnected. Um, we have a tendency to fall into a reductionist line of thinking where we pick one variable and we just tweak the hell out of it. Uh, we've done this with cattle and feedlots, with average daily gains. Um, we've done this with corn yields. We're really good at it, but what we're not good at is seeing the whole picture. So what I would really like everybody to think about is flavor. We've had this ongoing discussion about food where we think that all this business in my head about stuff tasting good, that has nothing to do with it. Really, I can just control exa exactly which nutrients I'm going to put into my stomach. The truth is nobody can do this. Even when scientists put people in what are called metabolic wards, where they precisely titrate everything they're eating, and they track their movements with radar, and they capture carbon dioxide to figure out exactly how much energy they're burning, they can't even predict how energy balance works in a human. So for all of you that think you can go through the supermarket and count calories, forget it. You can't. But we were all born with this system that was designed to give us the food that we need. And that these cravings, these desires erupt. It's why we like to have, a, you know, nobody just eats one thing for dinner. We like lots of things. As we grow older and our nutritional needs change, we start to actually like things that we hated when we were kids, like broccoli. There's a really good reason kids don't like broccoli, because they've got these incredibly high-burning metabolisms that just burn a lot of energy, and there's actually toxins in vegetables. And young, growing bodies are sensitive to toxins. So it makes sense that my son hate, hates broccoli, and it makes sense that I do like broccoli. So the way to navigate this is very simple. Just seek out the, the real food that is the most delicious. That will not steer you wrong. That is not giving you false information. And avoid the foods that were designed to be delicious, not by nature, not by millions of years of evolution, but by a human with a PhD. It's a pretty easy way to do that. Just look for the words flavor. Like I said earlier, artificial or natural flavor. There's a good example of it here. I don't want to make anyone feel guilty, but how is it that that coffee mate that's in that little squirter tastes like hazelnut? There's no hazelnut in there. Believe me, if you want hazelnut, eat a hazelnut. Have, even have a piece of cake with hazelnuts in it and have that with your coffee. I know it seems counterintuitive. Isn't there more calories there? I think it's better for you. So that is my message, the Dorito effect. It's how we change flavor. We are all driven by a lust for flavor and how we can change it back. So thank you very much for having me. And I, I would love to answer any questions you guys might have. I wrote the Dorito effect. I also wrote a book about steak. So if any of you, I have an interest in chicken, I have an interest in pigs, if any of you have any questions about livestock, I won't say I have all the questions. A year ago, I weighed 285. I went to, closer, closer. Oh, a year ago, I weighed 285. I went to uh, a guy and he coached me. I went to raw foods, natural foods like 50s and 60s. We all grew up in the 50s and 60s, big percentage of us. And it's the balance, like you talked, the flavor, the seasonings. It's just um, we're too fast paced society. We're too big of a hurry to go nowhere. Yeah, well, listen, that's, that's great. That sounds like that's worked out very well for you, so I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. But, I, you know, it's interesting. If you think about eating raw foods, that's going to steer you towards better foods. I mean, there's no such thing as a raw Dorito. There's no such thing as a raw Big Mac. So that's automatically taking you in this direction. But I think that's a great point, and I'm, I'm pleased it's worked out. Um, <clears throat> th this is kind of a... a it begs the question of the relationship between flavor and nutrition and profit, and the idea that... You can make something that is cheap and tastes good and make a higher profit than perhaps something that is truly nutritious, that takes a little bit more work. How do you see the relationship? What's the driver for this in, in how people relate to food and, and the relationship to money? Well, I'd say two things. The, the first thing to think about for anybody that is marketing their, what they produce directly or indirectly, 
flavor matters. So when I wrote my book about steak, I'd go to these farmer's markets and people would be doing grass-fed steak, grass-fed beef, and they were. They, it was authentic grass-fed beef. They just had no idea what they were doing. And for the most part, they'd kill their cattle way too early and it would be awful, awful beef. This is really bad marketing because nobody will buy food that tastes bad. But then I found when people actually knew how to raise grass-fed beef properly and got the cattle fat, that was better than anything and that got me hooked. That's why I wrote a book about it. It's like I'm, it's like I'm addicted to it or something, but in a good way. So on the one hand, flavor sells. People want to be turned on by what they eat. But if you can also sell the story about how what you're growing is more nutrient dense and that you can taste that in the flavor, that's important. I think that is something that people turn on to. And you might say, well, really? But we've already seen it. If you look at, um, not so much the nutrition side, but if you look at something like craft beer, all the growth in craft beer, or all the growth in the beer industry is in the craft segment. <coughs> The traditional brewers are snapping up craft brewers because they're not making any money selling, I guess, what you'd call commodity beer. There's, the margins are razor thin, and it's not growing. The growth is all in craft beer. People will pay more money for a craft beer because it has more flavor. And also because they feel that there's a story behind it, that the people making it aren't just trying to produce cheap beer and gallons of it, but that they're trying to express something. They're trying to share their love of beer through this craft beer. We also see it in wine. Wine's an older story. You look at how much red wine Americans drank in 1960 versus now, it's astonishing. We drink so much more wine. We don't drink wine because it's a cheap source of calories. Um, that's one of those funny categories where we actually are willing to pay a lot of money. And I think, I think there's hope there. I mean, our problem isn't that we don't have the money. This is a very, very well, you know, we live in the wealthiest continent in the world. There's a, a lot of consumers that have, that have money and will spend it on this but we have to get the message out there. I'm sorry, but as a follow-up question, it, it, it's intriguing the interplay between the, the producer and the consumer and how exaggeration of flavor or how consumers can be directed to make purchases and the role that flavor plays, whether it's associated with good nutrition. Yeah, it, absolutely. It plays a huge role. And, and, and this is, I mean, it's tough. How do you compete with a Dorito? Frito-Lay has sensory scientists who are sitting there in labs trying to make the most addictive, most delicious chip. As a farmer, you know, if it rains the day before you pro uh, harvest your tomatoes, your tomatoes are going to have probably more water in them than you'd like. So it is a battle. I think part of the way to get around that is to just spread the message and tell people that manufactured flavor is not the same thing as Mother Nature's flavor. And it's not because I have some mystical belief in Mother Nature, but it's just, it's just not the same. In natural foods, the flavor is, is a biochemical extension of what's in the plant or what's in the animal. And when we do that in labs and factories, we create something very different. So it's a matter of getting the message out. But I guess the other thing I would say is, as delicious as a Dorito might be, I think the best flavor experiences still come from nature. That if aliens landed and they said that they wanted to eat our most delicious food, we, we'd probably take them to... Uh, well, if it was anybody here, it might, be, it might be something that came off your own farm. It might be a tomato that you grow in the summer. Or we go to one of those restaurants where the, where the chef has a relationship with the people who forage the best mushrooms and grow the best produce and grow the best livestock. Cheese is another good example. Uh, people will pay an awful lot of money for really good cheese. So th there's value out there to be tapped, but we have a lot of work t you know, to turn it around. You know, one of the problems is that supermarkets, one of the, you know, it, one of the depressing things about this tomato that Harry Cleese created is that the big tomato growers don't have much interest in it because they say, well, I don't get paid for flavor. So if it's even 98% as productive as the flavorless one, they'll go with the flavorless one because there's, there's two points of margin there, and that's how thin it is. So I guess the reason I point to things like wine and craft beer is just to say it's hard to turn this ship around, but it can be turned around. When you were talking about selectively breeding, mm -hmm. as far as beef production goes, have you noticed any differences within genetics as far as flavor or basically just the way they're developed versus conventional beef or grass-fed? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I got this a lot, and um, there can be a tendency in the world of beef to talk about breeds of beef the way we talk about varieties of wine. So like uh, Angus versus Hereford would be Cabernet Sauvignon versus Cabernet Franc or something like that. I don't think that analogy holds. And the reason is that animals don't tend to produce their own flavor. There's things in meat that are, um, you know, 
textures can differ between breeds. And there are some extreme examples. Uh, Wagyu cattle have a distinctive texture and a distinctive flavor because they have a, an enzyme that desaturates some of their fat and that produces different flavor compounds when you cook it. So Wagyu has a distinctiveness. That's not to say it's better. I really like it, but I like other breeds. I think we need to think of breeds as, as a response to a condition. And you need to get the breed that is right for whatever conditions you have. So I wouldn't put Highland cattle uh, in an Arizona feedlot. Um, but I wouldn't put, you know, cattle, uh, hot weather tropical cattle like uh, Senapol up in the Orkney Islands. Um, they will produce flavor insofar as they respond well to their environment. But where that flavor comes from is from the food they eat. I animals are not flavor, they don't produce the flavor compounds. Plants are the master chemical makers of the natural world. I guess this is a mix of a question and a comment. So traditional Chinese medicine would say the same thing you're saying. And they actually talk about it in the form of qi and energy and they say, get a balance of all those different flavors, you know, and, and a lot of people that travel in Asia, and you may know this as well, say that they have all those different components, like properly made Asian cuisine really wants things that are flavored because they say your body literally takes that, not only nutrition, but in a form of energy, and it's a better body because it has all those different flavors to it. Yeah, I think that's, it's probably where Western medicine, or all medicine, grew, grew out of this. Um, we see interesting behaviors, um, things like eating dirt. Um, we tend to look down, I'm not suggesting anyone run out and eat dirt, but it's a very common behavior, especially in the tropics. A lot of pregnant women will eat dirt. And uh, a lot of times, scientists will sort of look down on this as some kind of a strange mania, um, a terrible behavior that had to be controlled. But then they do all these, they notice that animals do it too, and it has to do with things like having an iron deficiency or, or, or even eating things like clay to detoxify chemicals. So we have these same tendencies that animals do. And I think, I'm not someone who's against Western medicine or against Western science. I think a lot of that grew out of that. The problem we have is reconciling what we experience intuitively with what we know cognitively, and sometimes they don't get along. Anybody else? My question is, how natural are the spices that we buy? And can we actually use the word natural? Isn't that sort of being held hostage by everybody? And so you can't just look for the word natural. And now to get flavor and a lot of stuff, you just got to spice it up. Are the spices natural? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I would say, you, you know, when I did my steak book, one of the things I found is that it wasn't until relatively recently that we started putting things like Montreal steak spice on steak because steak used to have enough flavor on its own. So if you look at a cookbook from... Oh, probably the 1940s and earlier, all the recipes for steak, it was just salt and pepper. And you can look back on this and think that they were just unsophisticated morons. But the truth is their, their beef just had a lot more flavor than our beef had, has now. So we've, Montreal steak spice is what the, you know, the Jewish immigrants in Montreal used to put on a brisket before they smoked it. And eventually someone figured out, well, I'll put that on steak to, to try and get some of the flavor back in. That is probably improving. Uh, the blandness of a steak, and you're actually adding some, some interesting compounds back in, some, some chemical complexity, let's put it that way. I still, don't th I still think you're better off producing just better beef to begin with, but don't be afraid of spices. I think there's a lot of interesting things in spices. Um, uh, it's really interesting when you look at spices. It's almost like they're poisonous. Mo most spices are produced by plants to stop predators from eating the seed or eating w whatever's in the plant. And we're really interesting in that we take that, we turn it into a powder, and we just say, well, we just want a little bit of it. And when we, you can look at interesting things. If you cook with spices, um, the, the fats will oxidize less. And so there's some people who think that this is actually improving the quality. But I would say don't be afraid of using spices. I think spices are great. As far as your comment about the word natural being held hostage, I totally agree. Um, it's being used in ways that corrupt its meaning and you can't really trust it. It's not well regulated. And when you see the word natural on things, you don't really know what it means. Um, you can create a flavor from a genetically modified yeast and call it a natural flavor. Now, whether you're pro or anti-GMO, I think everyone can agree that that's not really, it doesn't really mesh with anyone's idea of what they figure a natural flavor is. So when you're looking at food, I, I just, 
like Michael Pollan said, just try to eat closer to nature. We were involved in bringing a breed of cattle into the United States from Australia that was kept incredibly pure since 1925. And they were the pure Aberdeen Angus cattle. And we raise regular, normal American beef cattle as well on the same grass, the same forages. And we noticed a distinct difference in the flavor intensity on the old line Aberdeen cattle versus regular modern American black cattle, and, you know, Angus cattle or Charlay cattle or, or other breeds. And they're eating the same plants, but the flavor is different. Yeah, that's a very interesting observation. Um, so I think genetically there will be differences in the way um, some cattle m maybe express the flavor in their flesh, how much of it literally gets dissolved in the, in the cell membrane. But I think some of it may also have to do with things like maturity, that we favored later maturing cattle and bred some of that into traditional breeds like Angus because you get, you get a better growth curve and that's where you can make more money. Um, so I'm not dead set against the European breeds, uh, but I think if you want to get the flavor out of them, you've got to keep them for an awfully long time. And it's, you know, the, the shorter British stock are probably just a better strategy on grass. But I think, I think any, well, uh, Greg was showing photos yesterday of uh, a longhorn, a feral longhorn bull that was, uh, it was like basically surviving off scrub in Utah, in the Utah desert, and it got incredibly fat. It took a long, I mean, it probably was like seven or nine years old or something. Um, any breed can get you to a good place, but it's just a question of, is that the best model for you? So I, 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 I can't say exactly what's going on there, but I just wonder if a lot of that might be explained by other genetics being pushed into uh, our present day Angus cattle just to try and make them more feedlot suitable. Okay, well, let's give Mark a hand. Thank you.